Hello everyone and especially the space enthusiasts. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of space exploration and innovation as we take a closer look at SpaceX's remarkable creation, the Falcon 9 rocket. Get ready to learn all about its history, capabilities, and groundbreaking achievements. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our exciting space content. Let's get started. The birth of Falcon 9. In the early 2000s, a visionary entrepreneur named Elon Musk founded SpaceX with a goal to revolutionize space travel. Fast forward to June 2010, and the first Falcon 9 rocket took flight, marking a pivotal moment in space history. The Falcon 9 is a medium-lift launch vehicle that boasts impressive capabilities. It's designed to carry both personnel and cargo into Earth's orbit, and it's known for its partially reusable design. Reusability and safety. What sets the Falcon 9 apart is its reusability. The rocket is equipped with two stages. The first stage, or booster, which carries the payload initially, and the second stage that takes over once the booster has done its job. But here's the cool part. The first stage can actually land vertically after launch, making it available for reuse. With an impressive track record of 221 successful landings as of August 26, 2023, SpaceX has been able to significantly reduce the cost of space travel while maintaining exceptional safety standards. In fact, Falcon 9 boasts one of the best safety records among American rockets. Achievements and Milestones Let's talk achievements. On October 8, 2012, the Falcon 9 made history as the first commercial rocket to deliver supplies to the International Space Station. But that's not all. Falcon 9 also holds the title of being the only commercial rocket to transport astronauts to space. In January 2021, Falcon 9 shattered records by launching a whopping 143 satellites in a single mission. And speaking of records, it carried the heaviest payloads into geostationary transfer orbit including Telstar 19 volts and Intelsat 35E, each weighing a massive 6,761 kilograms. Evolution and variations. The Falcon 9 has gone through several evolutionary stages. From V1.0 to V1.1 and finally to the V1.2 full thrust with the Block 5 variation, each iteration brought improvements and enhanced capabilities. The Block 5 variation, introduced in May 2018, has become the workhorse of SpaceX's fleet. It's been qualified for NASA's most critical missions and even the National Security Space Launch Program. The future of Falcon 9, host. So, what's next for the Falcon 9? With its incredible track record and continuous advancements, this rocket is expected to play a pivotal role in the future of space exploration. We can look forward to more groundbreaking missions, satellite deployments, and perhaps even further expansion into deep space. And that wraps up our journey through the amazing world of the Falcon 9 rocket. If you're as excited about the future of space exploration as we are, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your fellow space enthusiasts. Thanks for joining us today, and remember, the sky is no longer the limit. Stay tuned for more captivating content. And until next time, keep looking up. And that is, of course, a system that we hope to never use, but it consists of eight Super Draco thrusters on this Dragon vehicle that are used only for this abort. And we say we hope to never use it. We hope to not be in the situation, but we have had situations where we've had incredible in-flight tests, unintentional. For example, there was the launch abort for the Soyuz for Nick Haig's first launch in 2018. Pretty exciting event, dynamic time, but something that showed us how robust these systems are. It performed nominally and carried Nick Haig and Alexei Ochinin back to safety. We got the verification of the launch escape system now armed. You mentioned Nick Haig. As I understand it, he counts himself having gone to space twice. That's right, or at least one, one, and, and, a one and a half. But this system is now active. They do that two minutes before loading of the props, since that, of course, then does prevent, present a more risky situation with that prop on board. And it will stay armed all the way through orbital insertion.
I've also been told by previous dragging crews that you can hear the system of valves opening and actually even the flow of the fu fuel itself as it comes on board. The scenarios in which the launch escape system will be used. F9 tanks venting for prop load in 10 seconds. Expect loud venting. There they are warning them about that exactly what you just uh, mentioned. Giving them a heads up that they'll be hearing those sounds. Yeah, Victor Glover was telling me it's a very noticeable process. You can hear the opening and the closing of the valves, and there are these low hums and kind of a fluttering sound as that super cold liquid oxygen and kerosene fill those large propellant tanks, first on the first stage and then on the second stage. It must be pretty exciting to be hearing those noises, knowing what that means and how much closer you're getting to liftoff. This is pretty unique in the launch industry, right? Where the astronauts are inside the Dragon, inside their spacecraft, as it's being loaded with propellants. That's correct. That launch escape system you're talking about, if it were if it were needed, it can get the crew several miles offshore out into the Atlantic Ocean. It's uh, those Super Draco engines capable of moving Dragon half a mile in just 7.5 seconds. So that's equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. So it really moves. It can also get it off the top of a moving rocket as well. So it, right. it's got to have that kind of power. Right, at all those different phases, all the way un until they're in orbit. And that's, that's one, one of the things that we protect for here as well when we look at the weather forecast. It's not just for the actual launch itself, but to protect for any of those contingency landing scenarios in the various areas where they would splash down in that event. Propellant load has started. And so now the propellants are flowing into the Falcon 9 rocket, RP-1, refined kerosene, and liquid oxygen, the oxidizer. That part we can see externally because as the liquid oxygen levels rise inside the Falcon 9, it of course, super chilled liquid oxygen, highly densified, and it will super chill the skin as well of the rocket and it will condense the air around it. And there's been well over 200 Falcon 9 launches, so if you've seen one before, you're familiar with the sight. The rocket uh, condensing that air, that uh, warm, humid Florida air, which we have been enjoying this evening, at least with a light breeze. <laughs> That's right. I think it's cooler than Houston anyway, so <laughs> I'm enjoying my time here. Good, good. All right, uh, for another update, let's send it out to Hawthorne, California, an update from SpaceX. Thanks, Daryl and Jessica. Now, before we send them to space, let's get to know our Crew 7 astronauts a little better. We'll start off with none other than the commander herself, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mabelli, making her debut space flight. My name is Jasmine Mabelli. I'm the commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. Baldwin, New York is where I grew up. I always loved team sports from a really young age because you rely on one another, and that's something that I think is really important to know going forward in your career. I joined the Marine Corps. Sure, I wanted to fly jets. I thought you had to be a jet pilot to become an astronaut. I actually went to watch STS-116 launch while I was waiting to start flight school, and Sunny Williams happened to be on that flight. I realized she was a Navy helicopter pilot, and from that point on, I went full steam ahead all four of us are so proud to represent 
what is possible when we come together. Ultimately, everything we do is to benefit the Earth. Right next to Jasmine in Dragon Endurance is Andreas Mogesen, today's pilot representing the European Space Agency and making his second trip to low Earth orbit. My name is Andreas Mogensen, and I'm the pilot of NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International okay. Space Station. I was born in Copenhagen, Denmark. In 2008, ESA were looking to select a new class of astronauts, and I applied together with about 8,500 Europeans. So I thought, there's just no way that I'll get selected. The uh, chances of being selected are, are too small. But that changed when we were down to about 20 candidates. My first mission to the International Space Station was on a short 10-day mission. Uh, I had to hit the ground running as soon as I arrived on board, and as soon as I landed back on the Earth, I knew that I wanted to go back to the space station. I'm especially proud of the fact that our Crew-7 mission has four different astronauts from four different countries and four different agencies. Next up, mission specialist Satoshi Furukawa. This JAXA astronaut is no stranger to the space station. After spending 165 days in orbit as part of expeditions 28 and 29 in 2011. My name is Satoshi Furukawa. I am a mission specialist for NASA SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Yokohama, Kanagawa, which is right south of Tokyo first human landing on the moon when I was five years old. I thought it was a great moment for humankind. I had a longing for space from my childhood. The moment I was selected as a Japanese astronaut candidate, you are hired, you are selected. It was the happiest moment in my life. Crew 7, we are conducting many scientific researches on the space station to benefit future space explorers. I am very proud of being a part of this excellent team of international partners and also researchers, engineers, flight controllers, flight directors, and so on. Because working as a team and working together, we can accomplish the big mission. Rounding out our fully international crew is Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. He, he was selected to the cosmonaut corps in 2018 and, marks, and today marks his first flight to the orbiting laboratory. My name is Konstantin Borisov and I'm a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. For those who ask what space flight is. I would say that we have three big jobs on the space station. First job is experiments, second job is take care of the station, doing the maintenance, repair what's broken, storing things, restoring things, cleaning up. And the third big topic is actually taking care of your body because in weightlessness you cannot help but train. I think Many people don't understand that technology advancement which we have had during the last 50 years mainly comes from space exploration. People get very comfortable with using their phone and we have very fast computers and space motivates us to create those advancements. I want to take part in it and I want to put my small stone into this pavement which leads us to the new asteroids, to the new planets and to the new systems. As we see with all of our crews, these four crew members who make up Crew 7 have a mission patch they worked together to design. The first thing that you notice is the white dragon on top of the Earth, its neck craned into the number seven for Crew 7. Its tail curves upwards towards a golden star, and they say that symbolizes our ascent towards the stars and the pioneering spirit needed to propel us further into space. The blue, white, and red on the tail are the common colors in the flags of all four nations flying on this mission. Now we are less than 30 minutes to launch, so let's check back in with Daryl and Jessica at KSC, where the countdown continues. All right, thank you very much. Everything going uh, well with the countdown so far. A little over a mile and a half from the launch pad we're going from today, this morning, 39A, is 39B, where the mobile launcher is back out on the pad right now, going through testing for the Artemis II crewed mission to the moon late next year. Here's more about Artemis 
in our Moon Minute. For the first time, Artemis II astronauts got an up-close look at the Orion spacecraft that will fly them around the moon. Astronauts Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Jeremy Hansen visited Orion at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And it looks amazing. Their handiwork is gorgeous. I'm ready to take it for a spin. Until launch day arrives, the crew is training at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. They use the neutral buoyancy lab, a giant pool, to practice safely getting out of a floating mock-up of Orion. And it's not an easy task. Navy divers in rafts will harness and hoist the astronauts into the air by helicopter, where they will be taken to a nearby Navy vessel. Back at Kennedy, we got a look at the brand new Artemis crew transportation vehicles. So the first nine miles of the journey to the moon starts in these crew transport vehicles. On launch day, these fully electric, zero emission vehicles by Canoe Technologies will reunite the Artemis II astronauts with Orion at Launch Complex 39B. NASA's powerful moon rocket, the Space Launch System, and Orion will carry them on the rest of the 250,000 mile journey to the moon. And that's your Artemis Moon Minute. And for Artemis updates, there's a QR code on the bottom left of your screen, right there, actually bottom right. You can visit, uh, you can use your cell phone to scan it or you can visit the website at nasa.gov forward slash Artemis 2. Earlier this evening, our own NASA's Jasmine Hopkins caught up with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, who is here watching the launch from SpaceX's firing room. Administrator Nelson, today marks a first for NASA, the first time in a single launch that each astronaut represents a different space agency. So we have NASA, ESA, JAXA, and Roscosmos. What do you make of this diverse crew? Well, it's a sign of our times. Uh, we are an international program. For example, we're going back to the moon in order to go to Mars. It's going to be an international mission that will launch with an international crew. So too, tonight's launch is entirely an international crew, save for the commander, Jasmine, an American astronaut. And so here we go. Now, isn't it interesting that what space does in our NASA program, it unifies us. It brings people together. Uh, and this is so true with what we're seeing tonight. Right, and Administrator, you recently visited South America, and later on this year you're planning to visit India as well. Why is it so important for NASA to foster these international partnerships? They are delighted, indeed, eager to learn more about NASA and to partner with NASA. And so that's what we find when we go to another country. Uh, it's usually the president that wants to see us. And for example, in this South American trip, uh, we talked to the president of Brazil and Colombia about what NASA can provide in the way of information from our satellites to help them protect the Amazon rainforest from being destroyed, which is a high agenda item for those countries. Indeed, it's a high agenda item for the entire world. Um, I'm going to India. India is uh, one that we want to have a close relationship with. We've already been doing things such as uh, science experiments with India. We've got a major science uh, program going that will be Earth observing with India next January. But now we're going to train and fly an Indian uh, astronaut. So. It is happening as we speak, and uh, the United States has been the benef beneficiary of it. Absolutely. Administrator Nelson, thank you so much. Back to you. As we continue to count down, let's take a closer look at the vehicles that will be taking Crew 7 to the International Space Station today. Starting from the very top of the vehicle is the Dragon spacecraft. In total, there are 16 Draco thrusters Dragon can use in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination, each providing 90 pounds of force. 
That doesn't include the eight Super Draco thrusters used for an abort, which are no longer active once the crew is in orbit. And just wanted to note one thing that we did miss just a moment ago was a call to the crew. Uh, there was a, a, a sensor issue that they are tracking. However, um, they are just continuing with the count, continuing to monitor it. And so we are continuing to discuss what we have in front of us, which is Dragon. Together, the Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stand over 26 feet tall. There are two windows on the spacecraft, plus one under the nose cone. The nose cone opens shortly after launch to expose the forward bulkhead thrusters and docking mechanism that will connect with the space station. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight. The trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo, and on some cargo resupply missions, we use Dragon's trunk to deliver the new solar arrays that are being installed on the space station. As always, Dragon will be delivered to orbit today by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust on its first stage, thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. Once the first and second stages separate, these engines are also used to help land the first stage. The first stage will perform three burns today as it makes its way back down to Earth. First is the boost back burn, where three of the M1D engines will reignite to help flip the first stage around to head back to the launch site. The second burn is the entry burn. That's where a single engine will reignite and shut down to help slow Falcon 9 down as it prepares to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And then finally, the landing burn. That'll be where three engines will slow down the rocket enough to perform a precision landing back down on landing zone one. Meanwhile, the second stage continues to orbit, powered by one single Merlin vacuum engine with over 220,000 pounds of thrust. The second stage will secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its journey to the space station on its own thrusters. About 40 seconds after, Dra after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin, exposing its guidance navigation controls that help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. With T0 coming up in just about 20 minutes, our teams at the Cape and Hangar X are doing a series of system checks to ensure Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready. Let's check in with Ronnie for a quick status update. How's it going, Ronnie? Thanks, Jesse. We are still looking good for an on-time launch just over 20 minutes from now, and we'll keep monitoring all the vehicle systems. There we heard the call out for RP-1 load complete on stage two. Um, so that means we are, of course, getting closer to liftoff. Both Dragon and Falcon 9 continue to be healthy, and we're not tracking any major issues at this time. Right now, we're continuing to prep the vehicle for flight, and propellant loading began at T minus 35 minutes. We also heard the call out a few minutes ago that the launch escape system is now armed. The range, which is monitoring keep out zones and um, other key flight requirements, also continues to report no issues, and they are go to support launch tonight. Weather also looks good, and we are still tracking just a 5% chance of violation at our T0 time. But as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch window, driven by the orbital mechanics constraints of two spacecraft meeting in orbit. Fun fact, the technical term for that meeting is called a rendezvous. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we will have to stand down tonight because of that instantaneous launch window and instead target our backup opportunity, which is tomorrow at 3.04 a.m. Eastern time. But for now, with all systems go, let's turn it back over to Courtney for a status update from Houston. Thanks, Ronnie. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are ensuring that the space station is ready to receive Dragon. They're also checking all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly, and right now, everything is proceeding as planned. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the station will monitor the autonomous docking of Dragon tomorrow when they enter joint operations, which happens when the spacecraft enters the approach ellipsoid, which is an invisible boundary that helps us monitor spacecraft arriving and departing. After docking, the crews will perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to ha happen about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for opening remarks for the new crew members. Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Chris Dobbins is on console overseeing the team for launch, and Flight Director Judd Freeling will be on console tomorrow for docking. That's it from here in Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? All right, thank you very much, Courtney. And if you just joined us, T-minus 17 minutes and counting. 
from the seventh astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Jasmine Mogbelli, pilot Andreas Mogensen, or Andy Mogensen, and mission specialist Satoshi Furukawa and Kasing Borisov are strapped into their seats inside the Dragon Endurance. They're at the top of the rocket. Falcon 9 rocket fueling. That operation is well underway. Launch escape system is armed. Of course, that means Dragon is prepared and to launch Dragon itself. SpaceX. Stand by for an update on the sensor. Teams are still discussing and looking for our path forward. As you just heard there, SpaceX is SpaceX, very happy. looking at a sensor issue. So trying to determine if the sensor is giving good data, good reading, or if... Startup stage two, lock floating. If they're looking at something else, of course, we'll keep close tabs on that. In the meantime, propellant load continues. I think sometimes you have hits on sensors for other reasons. We want to make sure that we are getting an accurate reading of what's happening with the system they're looking at. Probably trying to decide if it's a, a real signal or if it's a hit from some other reason. There's a lot of redundancy in the systems, as you mentioned, and those sensors have to be make sure that the engineers understand exactly what they're looking at. So we'll, again, keep tabs. In the meantime, here's a little bit about Crew 7. Lieutenant Colonel Jasmine Mogbelli, a military helicopter test pilot. There she is. She hails from Long Island, New York. She's a mother to two twin girls, and she is the mission commander. This is pilot Andy Mogensen's second trip to Space Station. His first was as the flight engineer for the ESA IRIS mission in 2015. Mission Specialist Satoshi Furukawa's interest in space began when he was five years old and he saw the Apollo 11 moon landing on TV. And Mission Specialist Konstantin Borisov was selected to be a cosmonaut in 2018 and this will be his first trip to space. We've got... Uh, more than 10,000 people all gathered, including these folks. Some special students. Uh, those kids are, I should call them kids, they're students, right? Uh, college students. They're part of the First Nations launch, and they're giving us a big wave from the Banana Creek viewing location. They're from the University of Washington, University of Colorado, and Queens University. They're visiting as part of NASA's First Nations launch, an Artemis student challenge where they design, build, and launch their own high-powered rockets. And those students that you saw there in the stands, they were the grand prize winners. So welcome and enjoy the launch. T-minus 14 minutes and counting. Awaiting Crew 7 are seven crew members at their destination at the International Space Station. I caught up with three of them as they were zipping around the Earth. Hey, Daryl, good morning. Well, good morning to you, Frank, Stephen, and Woody. Okay, minutes away from liftoff, you're inside the spacecraft, what's it like? The rocket is a living, breathing machine. Uh, we fuel the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad while the crew is on board. I expected that my heart would be racing, but actually it was just so much like training that I felt quite calm. Well, I'm sure calm will give way to excitement, right, when Crew 7 comes aboard. What do you think that'll be like? More than anything, it's your friends coming up to station, right? And so you get to hug and uh, greet your friends that you haven't seen for several months. Uh, and it's always just a really fun reunion. You know, they're coming on board. They're going to live on board. It's really exciting to greet them as uh, new friends and crewmates. Well, those new friends and crewmates, will you have any advice for them when they come on board, like things to do, things not to do? The awesome thing is that we have an amazing ground team that catches all of it uh, and keeps us uh, honest and, and keeps us out of trouble. And so you can just kind of uh, relax and enjoy it and just uh, allow yourself to take it in because it really is a pretty special experience. Really enjoy your time up here. 
uh, with the people, with the environment, and with the opportunity to uh, to work up here and look at the earth. It's it's really amazing. Just really enjoy it. All right. Speaking of enjoyment, do you have a fun way to confirm that you're in space? Something you can do? You want to give that move a score, Jessica? I don't know. It required assistance from two crew members, so I don't know. I'll, I'll give it an 8.5. <laughs> that was very kind. All right, well, before the Crew-7 uh, got into their spacecraft, we have a picture with the Falcon 9 booster that will take them up into space. And there, there they are on the business end of those nine Merlin engines. Once we leave planet Earth... These fine folks at Johnson Space Center will take and over. Dragon this is SpaceX. Mission Control. We are still continuing to assess that sensor and proceeding with the count. Okay, so as you heard, they're... SpaceX Dragon copies continuing with the count while the team's assessed. Still working the sensor, but at the same time, continuing to load the propellants on board Falcon. So Jessica, as we count down these last few minutes, you've got the launch team. They're taking a look at they're taking a look at a sensor and some of the readings there. At the same time, we're proceeding forward, and they're communicating with the astronauts inside. And so, as we uh, get down to these final minutes, any thoughts? This is an exciting time for the crew. You know, they're probably running through some checklists of their own right now. They may, may be pretty busy in there going through those same things that they've done in their simulations so many times before. But I bet it's getting pretty real right now. Hearing those calls about the sensor probably raises a few questions as well, but I know the ground will keep them performed as we go. 10 minutes, it's getting very close. Indeed it is, and tracking everything are Leah and Ronnie at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We'll take us through the rest of the count. Thanks, Daryl. Our next major countdown event will be at the T-minus 10 minute mark, so coming up here, when the Falcon 9 launched mid- There we go ahead and have the Dragon astronauts are standing by for dis display configuration, which will let them know that we are even closer to liftoff. The launch commit criteria that we're waiting to hear that call out for are specific thresholds and pieces of information about the entire Falcon 9 system needed to make sure that the rocket is healthy. Of course, we do have many systems in place to ensure that the rocket and crew are both safe leading up to liftoff and during flight. Coming up on nine minutes until liftoff today, which is also about the same amount of time it takes to get to orbit, a nine minute ride. Uh, that's about the time we will see second stage cutoff. A few minutes after that is when we'll see Crew Dragon separate from the second stage. And we'll be listening to some performance calls as we get into the final countdown, of course, and then after liftoff. Uh, on the ground, you'll hear SpaceX flight controllers reporting on trajectory, speed, booster performance, and other key milestones. But there are some other calls you'll hear the crew make also after liftoff. These are different abort zones. They come in the form of different number and letter combinations. And these are throughout the flight up the eastern seaboard. So the first two are 1A and 1B. They have that name because they're in the first stage. That lasts until they're up to the very north of North Carolina. And the next are 2A through 2E. Those come into play when the second stage is powering Dragon. That takes us from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the northern Atlantic. Now, a little bit different from the other naming system, you'll hear the call Shannon, which refers to Shannon Ireland, meaning they would target off the coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and needed to abort. You'll hear those different calls uh, throughout the flight uphill, along with key performance callouts from the guidance navigation and control officer, as well as the propulsion lead.
One of the next call outs that we're listening for is the announcement that stage one engine chill has started. Right now, the propellant in the tanks is isolated from the engines, but at T minus seven minutes, we'll open up the engine free valves and start passing just a trickle of liquid oxygen through the Merlin engine pumps, chilling the engines for the start sequence. We do this because the super chilled and densified liquid oxygen is really cold, and we use that small amount of LOX to basically prepare the engine hard. There's a call out for engine chill. So now we're basically preparing that engine hardware to flow all the locks and propellant into it during flight. Next up, we should hear the call out for stage one RP1 load completion. And Dragon SpaceX, stand by for final go, but please confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, crew displays are configured for launch. All right, we heard their crew displays. Those three screens from which they can monitor the mission are configured for launch. Stage one, RP-1 load is complete. In confirmation that RP-1, the densified kerosene or the rocket fuel that repels the crew into orbit, loading is complete on the first stage. We did hear the second stage was completed a short time ago as well. Now T minus six minutes until launch. We are still loading liquid oxygen on the first and second stages. This is the oxidizer we need to combine with the densified kerosene that just finished loading. Coming up, we will hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count and then transition to internal power at about five minutes until launch. Then we'll hear the propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, adding some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for the strong back to retract. It'll move just a couple of degrees at first, and then we'll see it swing open completely at the moment of liftoff. That strong back provides access to Falcon 9's fueling lines and umbilicals for the prop load and the different gases being loaded on board. So we're continuing to check through a couple more fueling milestones, including one around the two minute mark, where we will hear that the liquid oxygen is finished on board the second stage. Dragon is configured for terminal count, and Dragon's on internal power. Falcon tanks are pressurizing for strong back recheck. So there we heard the call out that we are preparing for strong back retract. And as Leah just mentioned, the strong back is that white truss structure that you see on the left side of Falcon 9. Got a better shot of it right there. Strong back is retracting. Just before lift. There we heard the call out from Mission Control that we are retracting the strong back now. The strong back is part of the transporter erector, which was used not only to roll Falcon 9 out to the launch pad, but also to raise it into its vertical position. It will retract just about two degrees first after those clamp arms open up around the base of Dragon's trunk. And then just before liftoff, we'll actually go all the way back to 45 degrees retracted to give Falcon 9 and Crew 7 room for liftoff. Now under four minutes until launch. Next up, we're looking for the first stage liquid oxygen loading to finish at T minus three minutes. You're starting to see some white clouds on your screen. That is vapor, it's normal. We'll continue to see that build up as we get closer to launch. Obviously, this liquid oxygen that we're loading is super chilled, so a little bit of that will boil off in the hot Florida air. Six, seven, two, seven, launch of the airport. Huh? Stage one, one lock loading incomplete. Light to the best. Great view of Crew 7 there inside of the Dragon spacecraft, awaiting liftoff just under three minutes from now. Dragon is in terminal count. Move it. Now, now about two minutes and 30 seconds until launch. 
Next milestone, we're looking up for stage two locks load to complete. Additionally, shortly after that, we'll hear gas closeout begin, isolating the feed lines from the different gas systems for the Falcon 9 rocket. Those will get oh, vented over to the strong back itself. And blows to the No, Hermione. Stage two, lock floating is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Confirmation that stage two locks load is complete. Dragon and Falcon 9 fully fueled. Gas closeout has started. Expect loud venting. There's the gas closeout call that we expected. Additionally, we will be in auto idle. This puts the rocket in a state the flight computers understand before it takes over, making sure the transition to final countdown is smooth. Coming up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its computer will switch to countdown mode. We'll also hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon's in terminal count. Dragon's flight computer in countdown and configured for launch and the flight termination system now armed less than a minute until liftoff today. The flight termination Go system. Dragon You heard it, Crew 7 getting to go for launch, just 30 seconds away for an on-time launch. At the time of liftoff today, the space station will be flying 260 miles over southeastern Iraq. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine full power. And this off. Go Falcon, go Dragon, go Crew 7. Endurance ascends an international crew Copy. destined for the International Space Station. Stage one That's propulsion 1. 7 is million. Good calls from the propulsion officers here. Propulsion's nominal. 1.7 million pounds of thrust on Falcon 9, taking Crew 7 to the International Space Station, now traveling almost 300 miles per hour. Nominal power and telemetry. We are just about T plus 45 down. seconds into the seventh rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9, and right now the vehicle is throttling down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. There's the call out that Crew 7 is now moving faster than the speed of sound. Stage one, throttle up. Confirmation, we have moved through max Q and are throttling back up. Copy, one Bravo. Heard that call from Jasmine on Crew 7, as well as confirmation from the ground. The call out for one Bravo means we are in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing underway. to get good performance. We've got in, uh, engine chill on the second stage MVAC engine. We will then be looking for MECO or main engine cutoff where the nine engines on the first stage will cut off ahead of the first and second stages separating. Then the, not, the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite. We are now coming up on two minutes into the flight, the spacecraft traveling over 2,000 miles per hour. Really incredible nighttime views of Falcon 9 and Crew 7 on your screen right now. So as Leah just mentioned, we are keeping an eye on a couple of critical flight milestones coming up back to back here. Those are going to be Nico. So main engine cutoff now that we're throttling down stage one, followed by stage separation and second stage ignition. Main engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. 
Copy, two alpha. And back ignition. So there you heard and saw Miko stage set, and hopefully you heard Jasmine call out for the two alpha abort mode just before second stage ignition. And of course, this is the second stage powering Dragon on its flight, now traveling almost 4,000 miles per hour. Over three minutes since launch, the second stage will continue to power the spacecraft and our first look at the crew inside. We'll be standing by for Seco. That's the next major milestone for this second stage engine that comes shortly before nine minutes into the flight. So we've still got some time on this engine. So right now, while Crew-7 makes its way to orbit, our first stage booster is making its way back to land. So you may hear the callouts here on the net shortly that we are in the middle of our boost back burn. Right now, stage one is posting. SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Good callouts there that Dragon is on the right track. And confirmation from Commander Jasmine McBelly. Continuing to see good performance on this lone Merlin vacuum engine on the stage. Also, as we've heard, nominal trajectory. That's the guidance, navigation, and control officer here at SpaceX stating that we are on the correct path. Dragon's pointed in the right direction. The second stage continues firing until, like we mentioned, second stage engine cutoff at about eight minutes and 50, five zero seconds into the flight. Right now, we are four minutes and 30 seconds since our on-time liftoff, now traveling at 5,000 miles per hour. This single Merlin vacuum engine can provide over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space, doing its job to take our crew to the International Space Station today. Dragon speed set, trajectory nominal. More good news for Mission Control. Acquisition of signal, Marina. So with that Bermuda call out, we actually know that the ground station transmitting this flight data back to us is coming from Bermuda. The crew is currently pulling a little more than one G as the second stage engine continues to propel their flight. Continuing to hear good calls to the crew, now five minutes and 30 seconds into the flight, traveling at 6,400 miles per hour. Again, we will continue to see the second stage fire for about three more minutes. Shortly after second stage engine cutoff, we will see it separate from Dragon, which will continue its journey. Now at this point in the flight, we are just about 15 seconds away from stage one entry burn start. At this point, the center engine on Falcon 9 will be lit for just about 10 seconds to help us slow the vehicle down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. That's not the only thing helping us on re-entry, though. The first stage sees high drag on re-entry, which scrubs roughly 70% of the velocity by the time the landing burn begins, which you just had great views of on the left-hand side of your screen. Florida Space Coast beginning to come into view in the background. All while Crew 7, of course, on the right hand side of your street, screen, lit up by that MVAC engine, continues on its way to orbit. And we are now coming up on. Continuing to get good calls as we reach almost seven minutes into the flight. Crew traveling at 9,400 miles per hour. Again, we still have about one minute, 45 seconds left with the second stage propelling the crew. And of course, we are also expecting that landing burn start from Falcon 9 any second now. Great views.
Steve, FTS has saved. Great news there that stage one has successfully landed back at landing zone one in Florida. And stage two continues to propel Dragon and our crew seven crew members. We now are coming up on Seco, second stage engine cutoff. Again, we're looking at that about eight minutes and 50 seconds into the flight. Everything continues as planned today, now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. Again, we're looking for eventually a good orbital insertion at which we'll be traveling. Good calls here at Mission Control in Hawthorne. And we are standing by for second stage engine cutoff. Copy, Shannon. Heard that call for Shannon. That is the call out for Shannon Ireland, the final abort zone. MVAC shut down. There's audio confirmation, and you can see on your screen that we have had successful state second engine cutoff one of our MVAC engine. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. Dragon and good news there that Crew 7. Nominal orbital insertion. Dragon SpaceX, awesome to hear. Disarmed. That's the first look at the crew, now in microgravity, confirmation of a good Earth orbit insertion. We are now coming up on 10 minutes into the flight. Of course, we saw second stage engine cutoff, and you're actually getting a look at their zero-G indicator there. Uh, we'll stand by for them to tell us a little bit more about that shortly, but we are also standing by for second stage separation from Dragon. So as Leah mentioned right now, Dragon and Stage 2 are still attached. Great views of that zero-G indicator there. And what we're doing right now is basically letting any residual dynamics of the vehicle settle out prior to separation. We are expecting that separation event in probably about 90 seconds. Crew looks like they're having a great time up in space, too. And as we stand by for that separation, shortly thereafter, we'll be looking for the nose cone to begin deploying. Uh, that command will be sent, and we'll see it open shortly after. We'll need the nose cone to open to expose those forward bulkhead thrusters, as well as the docking mechanism with which they will use to uh, link up with the International Space Station. After their ride, it's almost 30 hours long. Again, we had liftoff right on time today at 3.27 a.m. Eastern Time. The crew making a smooth journey into orbit. It's now been 11 minutes, 20 seconds since that liftoff. We had confirmation of good orbital insertion, and we are standing by for second stage separation from Dragon. Great views of mission control here in Hawthorne, California. And the SpaceX team standing in the background, standing by for Dragon separation. Of course, you also have continued telemetry readouts from Dragon and Stage 2 in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Crew 7, on behalf of the Falcon launched. team, I'd like to welcome you to orbit, and we hope you enjoyed the ride on Falcon 9. Space travel is difficult, even though you make it look easy, so thank you for trusting us to get you up there. 
it's not a bad way to spend a day in the office. Stand by for words from the launch director. Hello, Crew-7. This is Launch Director here on Countdown. On behalf of the entire SpaceX launch and recovery team, I'm honored to welcome Dragon's first ever all-international crew to orbit. Shisleva Puti, Gotor, Itera Shai. Godspeed, Crew-7. Cheers. SpaceX, uh, thanks for the ride. It was awesome. On behalf of Andy, Satoshi, Kochi, and I, we'd like to thank the multitude of people who've led us to this unique moment. We may have four crew members on board from four different nations, Denmark, Japan, Russia, and the USA, but we're a united team with a common mission. Uh, we hope the work do serves to benefit our beautiful home planet and those on it. As you said, human spaceflight requires an unparalleled level of vigilance and rigor, and we thank all those who prepared not only us, but also this truly impressive spacecraft for flight. Finally, to our families, carry the brave, greater burden of our choice to explore. Thank you. Go Crew 7. Awesome ride. Really incredibly moving words from Commander Jasmine Mokbelli now that she and her international team are up in space. That is going to end our coverage from Hawthorne until we pick back up with our docking coverage, like Leah mentioned, just about 30 hours from now. But for now, I'm going to hand it back over to Daryl and Jessica at Kennedy Space Center to wrap up our launch coverage tonight. All right. Thank you very much and great job. And Jessica, what a, what a launch. It was spectacular. Like we said, those night launches are something to see. You see all those bright lights. You see those little nitrogen pulses when that first stage is coming back down. Spectacular. Phenomenal roar, the thunder. You could feel it in your chest. And then, of course, the booster came back and landed, and that was in some extra pop. Pretty impressive all around. Sights, sounds, and even those feelings. That's new, of course, to crew, uh, to NASA crew, is bringing the booster back. Uh, NASA decided they have a lot of prop margin, uh, propellant that is, and so they burn the first stage a little less and the second stage a little more. and allows them to bring the first stage back and back to land, which is uh, good to see. And so you saw the uh, zero-G indicator floating around. Tell us what it was. I did. Well, that, Daryl, was a three-toed sloth. Important, a three -toed. Uh, important <laughs> distinction, not oh. a two-toed sloth. Oh, really? Yeah, so apparently this is one of Andy's kids' favorite animals. Mm -hmm. And as a family, they were even fortunate enough to see one in the wild in Costa Rica last Christmas uh, when they were on vacation. So it was all kind of fate leading up to this, I think. How about that? This is Andy uh, Mogensen. Andy Mogensen, the pilot. That's yeah. correct. That's right. And I guess his family calls him the slowest person in the world. So another reason why this three-toed sloth had such meaning for all of them. Well, that actual sloth in the uh, capsule looked like it was moving slow as well. But uh, <laughs> he's got an excuse. You know, we have a saying in space, and it's often true. Yeah. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Mm. And when you rush too much, especially in space, doing a spacewalk or anything that you're doing, you get in trouble. So slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. Wise words from our veteran space flyer, Jessica Meyer. <laughs> Jessica Muir, sorry. It's early. <laughs> hey, we got some social questions. Let's take a few. You do mind? Absolutely. All right. Well, let's look on our screen here. And here we've got one uh, that says, come Sunday morning. Beautiful shot right there, though, of the spacecraft looking out the back. Boy, that is high-resolution image. Come Sunday morning, Earth Eastern Time, what are the first few tasks the crew will do? Probably and how running will through some checklists of their best own right now. They mean and get maybe dialed pretty breezy in, in there, going through those. Well, when we wake up in the things morning, that they've done in their simulations so many times before, but I bet it's getting pretty real right now. And hearing those calls about the sensor probably raises a few questions as well. But I know the ground will keep them performed as we go. Ten minutes. It's getting very close. Indeed, it is. And tracking everything are Leah and Ronnie at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. will take us through the rest of the count. Thanks, Daryl. Our next major countdown event will be at the T-minus 10 minute mark, so coming up here, and when the Falcon 9 Dragon launched mid- for display configuration. There we go ahead and have the Dragon right, astronauts right. are standing by for dis display configuration, which will let them know that we are even closer to liftoff. 
The launch commit criteria that we're waiting to hear that call out for are specific thresholds and pieces of information about the entire Falcon 9 system needed to make sure that the robot...